Hi, I'm Kevin Borland, and in this video, I'm going to teach you how to phase a parent using the DNA of a child. The first thing you'll need to do is go to the Borland Genetics Users Group on Facebook and download a copy of the Borland Genetics DNA Reconstruction Toolkit. If you scroll down to the first announcement, you'll see a link to a Dropbox folder where you can download the program as well as instructions and the press release. After downloading the toolkit, I recommend saving it onto your desktop. When you first run it, it will automatically create a data library folder within your documents folder. It'll be empty and you'll need to copy your DNA resources downloaded from the testing companies and unzip them there. Do not create any subdirectories within the folder. I've already loaded a lot of DNA kits here and reconstructed many as well. I'm going to scroll down to my mother, Kathy, and we're going to take a look at her raw DNA file and uh, see what it consists of. Let's open it up, and it's going to have some header data, and then below that it's going to have five columns with some positional data in the first three columns, and then the values measured in the fourth and fifth columns. This is what I call a stereo file because it contains data relating to both my mother's paternal and maternal copies of her chromosomes. Unfortunately, the data in columns four and columns five in a raw DNA file uh, are in no meaningful order on a position by position basis. That's to say that column four does not represent your uh, paternal copies of your chromosomes and, and uh, you know, column five does not represent your maternal. At each position measured, the first uh, allele can be paternal or it could be maternal. Uh, and there's no way of knowing without phasing. And phasing is the act of creating two separate mono uh, DNA kits from a single random stereo kit, uh, where the first kit will be a paternal copy of your chromosomes and the second will be a maternal copy. The traditional uh, method for phasing uh, has been to take the donor and a parent. Uh, essentially, what you're doing is you're taking the donor's DNA and you're going to subtract the parent's DNA, say the mother's DNA, and what you're going to have left is the father's DNA. And that's a little bit of an oversimplification, but that's the general theory of the phasing. The problem with traditional phasing is that for a lot of people, they just don't have an available parent to test. Uh, either the parents died long before uh, commercial DNA kits were available or because uh, the very reason maybe they took their DNA test is because they don't know who their parents are, or sometimes just because a parent doesn't want to provide their DNA information for privacy or whatever reason. Uh, fortunately for a lot of people, the next best thing to testing a parent for facing purposes is testing a child. Uh, because just like the traditional phasing method, testing uh, a child and phasing using a child's data also organizes uh, your DNA into uh, a meaningful, uh, two separate meaningful mono kits. And one of those files will represent the shared DNA, the, the DNA that you pass to your child, your common alleles, and that's called the in-phase uh, kit. And the other will have all of the DNA that you have left over that you could have passed to your child. Uh, and that's often called the evil twin uh, copy of one's chromosomes. And now, unlike... Uh, the traditional method, you're going to get a couple recombination points uh, per chromosome on average. That is where you switched from passing your child your father's DNA, and instead you the, the stream of DNA broke, we'll say, and it reconnected or recombined, and you started passing your child the uh, maternal copy of your chromosomes. But fortunately for us, this only happens maybe... 50 times or so uh, across our entire genome. And it's just a matter of finding those recombination points and assigning phase uh, between them, whether uh, you pass your child your paternal copy or your evil twin your paternal copy, and vice versa. You would have passed your maternal copy to your child if you passed your paternal copy to your evil twin. And for a lot of people, this is really easy to do. Uh, I say really easy. It takes a few hours, but I'm going to walk you through it. And uh, this may be the option for you if you have no available parent to test and you want to completely phase your data into paternal and maternal copies. So the next thing we're going to do is fire up the uh, Borland Genetics Toolkit and go to the Resource Manager. And 
uh, what you're going to do is add the resources that are necessary for phasing here, me and my mother, because uh, I'm going to phase my mother into uh, two kits representing my grandparents. Add a Build 37 resource, uh, and that's pretty much any major commercial uh, kit, such as Ancestry, MyHeritage, Family Tree, DNA, or 23andMe. Um, then you can, there's Kathy, and we're going to add her to the active resource list. It takes a second to load, and it's going to uh, determine some important information about the kit that it's going to need to uh, when it processes it. You have to tell it the gender, I'm putting female. The reason it needs to know that is so it can handle the X chromosomes properly. And if you wanted, you could put in a gen match number. I'm not going to do that right now. It's just for bookkeeping purposes. So let's add my DNA now, same process. And we're just adding uh, information about these kits, including where they're stored on the computer and what types of kits they are uh, to the active list in memory. And we could save that resource list if we wanted to. We're not going to get into that in this video. So now you can see the active list has both of our DNA kits there, and they are stereo kits, of course, and they are uh, full kits. They are not partial reconstructions, uh, which this program also handles. Now let's get phasing. We're going to go back to the main menu, and we are going to select the ultimate phaser tool, and that is basically access to the phasing engine. Uh, it allows you to do several different types of phasing. Um, we're going to phase two related individuals. And the two, of course, are the only two we have in our data list. And now it loads the kits, making sure they're on the same template. If they're not, for example, let's say one is on 23andMe and another is family tree DNA, we can convert them also using this tool. So we'll cover that later. First, we're going to do the in-phase allele, which is the data or the uh, DNA data shared between me and my mother that she passed to me. And it's fairly quick uh, creating that, and you have to give it a name. Uh, I like to call it, uh, I like to use and. Uh, so Kathy and Kevin, this is the data shared by both of us. And then it saves the output file. Then we're going to go back to the ultimate phaser, and we're going to this time select, well, we're going to select again the Kathy and Kevin, not the new phase data file, and we're going to perform a second operation on them. And this time, instead of getting the data we share in common, we're going to do Kathy x Kevin, uh, Kathy but not Kevin. So whatever data she had that she could have passed to me that she did not. And we're going to call that my evil twin. And we'll name it Kathy X Kevin this time. And then process. And what this is going to do is it's going to not only add it to the uh, active resource list, and we're going to check in a second to make sure it's there, uh, but it also saves a zip copy of each of these files that we can upload to GEDmatch. They should be GEDmatch compatible, assuming that the input files work. Um, and there they are. You see the original kits, and also beside them you see two mono kits, Kevin, uh, Kathy and Kevin, and Kathy, but not Kevin, Kathy x Kevin. So also, let's just go into our data library folder and make sure they're there and check them out. And there we have it. Kathy and Kevin. So now let's head on over to GEDmatch. The next thing we're going to need to do is run the matching segment search on each of these files. And uh, those are Tier 1 tools, so you'll have to pay for a Tier 1 membership in order to do this. Here we have the matching segment search under the Tier 1 utilities. We're going to run it twice, once for each of those output kits. But before we run the matching segment tool, we have to upload these files to GEDmatch, and we're going to do it just like we would any ordinary kit. Uh, let's call this one Kathy and Kevin. 
and select yes we have permission to upload this file and then we're going to choose the option for an artificial kit because this is an artificial or synthetic kit uh, choose the file i have it in my data library of course and it's important that you don't move these files even though it's tempting sometimes to organize them. The program relies on them being named what you named them in the file and uh, being where it put them. Uh, okay, so GEDmatch doesn't require that, but once you want to use them again in, in Borland Genetics, it requires that. Okay, so we've got it uploading, and you see in the bottom left the percentages are going up, and it's working fine. Um, and then the next thing we do is wait for it to process. Um, now my tool spits out the number is in build 37. So GEDmatch is build 36. So GEDmatch is going to convert it once it's ready. Here it goes. And then we just wait for a kit number. This kit is going to need to process before we run the matching segment tool. So I'm just going to show you what the matching, ma uh, matching segment tool does on you know, one of my other kits so you get an idea and uh, show you what settings to use. And remember, you're going to have to do this twice. You also have to do this for the Kathy X Kevin. And we're waiting, we're waiting. There we go. We have a GEDmatch number. And it has uploaded successfully. I'm just going to highlight it here for you. All the Borland Genetics kits will begin with a Z. So let's just quickly go over how to run the matching segments tool and which settings to use uh, because it's different uh, when you're working with phase data than when you're working with unphased data. Uh, the threshold settings can be a little more relaxed. So here we go, uh, matching segment search for real this time. Uh, and I'm going to use one from a different project that I just did uh, a few days ago for my cousin Susan. Uh, I'm going to choose 505 for the threshold settings, 500 SNPs. And I'm going to turn off the graphics because um, it makes it harder to paste into Excel if you have those uh, bars on there. Um, so this takes a few minutes, and uh, we're also going to have to do it with uh, – here I'm doing it for Jeff and Susan. And, and if I wanted to use the other kid, I, I also do have one Jeff X Susan. Because uh, I did this using the exact same process. Um, but this will take forever, so let's fast forward a little bit and let's take a look at what the output of a matching segment search looks like. Okay, so here we go. Uh, I fast forwarded a bit and it's done. I'm going to highlight and then I'm going to copy all of the data output from the matching segment search.
So in the interest of making the best use of your time, I'm not going to sit for the next six or eight hours and go through and, uh, and you know, find all the recombination points in Susan's file and uh, assign phase to them. And that would be kind of tough for me to do, too. I mean, it would be a lot easier for Susan because the names on the cousin lists or relative lists uh, uh, from the matching segment search, she's going to know who a lot of those are, and I'm going to know very few of them because we're only related on the Borland side. And all the other sides of our family, I, I haven't a clue who her uh, relatives are. So instead, uh, I did, uh, of course, uh, when I first came up with these tools, I re first phase uh, my mother using my data. Uh, and although those uh, temporary files are no longer on GEDmatch because I like to keep my uh, profile pretty clean, otherwise I'd have uh, 500 kits like I do in my uh, data library. But, uh, and I think GEDmatch might get annoyed if I did that. So um, what I'm going to do is go to the, I did this exact same process and I exported uh, Kathy and Kevin and Kathy X Kevin to two worksheets with an Excel workbook. I've already assigned phase to them, so I am going to unassign them and I'm just going to pick a random chromosome. How about chromosome 11 since it's an average size chromosome? And we'll do that together. Since I know who my relatives are, it should be pretty easy. Okay, so here we go. Um, I've got my 11th chromosome up, and I say mine, but it's, uh, it's uh, what I, I have two copies of my chromosome 11, of course, and this is my maternal. It's the what my mother passed to me. And then I also have pasted in another tab, Kathy, but not Kevin. And this is what she didn't give me. This is, you know, this here, the first one is good Kevin, we'll call me. And there is evil Kevin. So uh, the matches are very different, of course, because it's the opposite. Well, it's not even the opposite. It's not even a real chromosome. It's, it's it, I did not inherit this. This is what I could have gotten. I also put my brother in here uh, just to make things go faster, um, but this, that's not required. But since we have his data, might as well use him too. And I've uh, shifted the emails off the right side of the screen just for privacy reasons there. Um, okay, so what do we do? First, you notice I blacked out my Aunt Barbara. And the reason is it's my mom's full sister. And this is completely useless for this exercise because we don't know when we have a match to Barbara, whether it's because it matches her on my mom's dad's side or my mom's mom's side. So it's absolute or both. I mean, she may match both. I mean, she's a full sibling uh, for a certain strand of DNA. So we're going to ignore her and pretend her data is not here. So let's start with what we know. Okay. I'm going to use red for my mom's dad's side, and I'm going to use green for my mom's mom's side. Now, I happen to know Marilyn, and I happen to know that she is related to my, uh, my mom's dad. Um, her family is um, from the same village in Poland. Uh, let's see who else I know here. There's a nice Ukrainian name, and the, that is on my mother's father's side as well but i don't have to make assumptions based on name quite yet so i'm not going to go there actually though i also do know that these three people are in our lemco group uh, and they are cousins on my mom's father's side so let's get those since we do know them okay so from zero to four uh, remember we're talking about phase data here so anything that overlaps zero to four significantly is also going to be on that side so these are included i mean it starts a little earlier at 288 as opposed to 357, uh, but those have to be on the same side because they significantly overlap Maryland's match. Okay, so we've got a whole zone here. This one here, 69 to 78, so we know that HG must be my grandfather's side. Uh, and you'll see here, same thing. Okay. So, good start. Before we make any assumptions, let's go to the other, to Kathy X. Kevin. See if we recognize anyone here. Uh, ha, 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 ha. My brother. So, um, if my brother matches my mom here, uh, we know very well that my brother could only have one copy of my mom's maternal chromosome, uh, I mean my mom's chromosome, my brother rather only has one maternal copy of, of this chromosome 11. 
and he either inherited this segment if it matches my evil twin uh, from the maternal or from paternal side of my mother. Uh, it didn't switch over because the match is constant. The odds of it switching over are pretty slim on the 11th chromosome anyway. Oh, it does happen. But we're going to make the assumption from this that 40 to 120 is a continuous segment. We don't know what side of the family it is, but we're going to say that evil twin Kevin, and therefore Kevin also, does not recombine between 40 and 120. So let's go back to here. And let's apply that presumption here. So 69 here is what that's the border with the 40, right? So well, look at that. We know this is red all the way from 40 to 120, even though the matches don't go that far. So we know that my match with Steven from 40 to 120, or rather, my evil twins match with Steven from 40 to 120 must be on my mom's mom's side. And therefore, so must be any match that significantly overlaps 40 to 120. And my mom's mom is Lithuanian, so I'm not surprised to see names like uh, Vinauskas, which is a nice Lithuanian name there. Um, and I believe I've spoken with Catherine once, and I think she's part Lithuanian also. Okay, so... Now we've got some parts at the beginning here that we don't really know for sure, 25 to 35, well, basically from 0 to 40, and we don't know from 122 to the end of the chromosome. Is this helpful? Not particularly. Uh, actually, yes, because I see my cousin Frank, and I know my cousin Frank is a uh, uh, cousin on my mom's dad's side. So I know this is also red. Oops, sorry, I said red. So I know from 124 to 133 is red. So for anti-Kevin, for evil Kevin, I know that's green. Is that right? Make sure that's included. Yeah, 124 to 133. So that's overlapping this significantly. So one copy, my anti-self must be uh, green. Why is it not letting me color it? There we go. Okay, um, so really the only difficult part now is the from 0 to 40, uh, because it looks like there's, you know, from 122 to 1, there's no gap here, right? And it's not like all of a sudden Steven starts matching me over somewhere else or something. So it's safe to assume that from 120 to 124 here is also red, because my anti-Kevin is green there. Okay, so now we've just got 0 to 40. And there could be a recombination point in there. Uh, we already know 0 to 4 is my mom's dad's side. Uh, however, it's looking, based on Ukrainian names, uh, that it's probably likely that this whole thing is red. Also, it's not a very large uh, zone between 4.3 and 40. I know it says 69, but remember, the bound of this, the, 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 this must be uh, before 40 here. So let's take a look at Kevin and Steven and we'll make the problem a little easier. Now we already know this is green because we did this on the other one. So we know Steven is green from 112 to 120. Notice that anti-Kevin is not showing up in his match list, and that's because I, I made it a, a research kit, so research kits don't come up on match lists. But we know from 40 to 120, and also we see Catherine there, is my mother's mother's Lithuanian side. So we've got this here. But look, we got Frank, who is on my mom's dad's side. So there's a recombination that occurs somewhere here. Um, Let's look at Kathy and anti-Steven, bad Steven, evil Steven. And so what do we have here? Here now we see my Lemko cousins on my mom's dad's side. Uh, I'll color those red. And it's nice to have all, okay. And I can tell you right there, that's about as Lithuanian as the name gets. 
uh, 26 to 33 is going to be green. Um, so it would appear. Does that make sense? Well, we'll see. Um, and then 40 to 120, we know, matches Kevin. And from here, Kevin, 40 to 120 is red, right? So for the anti-Steven, we can put that as red. Uh, all the way up to 120. And then from 122 to 129, we got JL. Oh, there's JL, and we know it's green. So Steven recombines twice. Well, uh, we know since anti-Steven recombines twice, one here and one's here, that Steven must recombine at the same spots. So anything over 122, we can put, well, over 120, we're pretty sure, we can put as red. All right, and see that matches here. And anything under 40, we know my brother is green. Or I'm sorry, his, his evil twin is green, so he is red. And that's consistent with Ukrainian names. My cousin Marilyn on my mom's dad's side. So it's looking like, oh, well, now that we've done that, let's see if we have any outstanding ones here. We've got Ryan, Lulu, and Joseph. We can take a look and try to find those. There they are. Uh, those turn out to be green. So I have no recombinations, and it's just coincidence. DNA has a random uh, aspect to it. And let's see, what did we determine about these? From 6 to 12, we got names here like Chernyshenko, and that's Ukrainian, and we know that that actually is on my mom's dad's side. So from having done it over here with Stephen. I'll make these red. So when my mom had me and during meiosis, there was no, no uh, recombinations on chromosome 11. And uh, so we got all red there. We got all green. Steven, it goes red, green, red. He had two recombinations. And for anti-Steven, he had green, red, green. And again, I made life simpler by including my brother in this analysis, and it just flies by. You can probably do the, every chromosome all together in about three hours. Um, but if you only included one per project, uh, you know, if you didn't have a brother to add extra data and, you know, have extra clarity as to where recombination points are, it might take six to eight hours. Uh, but it's still doable, It's it, unless you just don't know who any of your relatives are. Um, and in which case, I mean, contact some of them or try to do some of their family trees and for them if they don't have one, or go to Dr. Dead Match and see if they do. Uh, or, you know, uh, look for, if you're, if like me, you know, you have different nationalities on both sides, I mean, look for Lithuanian names versus Lemko, Polish, and uh, Ukrainian names. Um, that's not foolproof. You want to do that after you've, uh, you know, after you've picked the low hanging fruits of people that you actually know and assign face to them. So we did one chromosome, and we did it twice, kind of. Uh, we did it once uh, reverse phasing my mom's uh, DNA with respect to me, and once uh, reverse phasing her DNA with respect to Stephen, my brother. Uh, and it wasn't that bad. Um, there's very low uh, match density on uh, Lithuanian uh, ethnicity, just so you know. So if you've got, like, colonial New York or, uh, you know, colonial Massachusetts ancestry, or you're going to have a lot more matches per Santa Morgan. Um, and it'll be infinitely easier usually to, uh, to do this process. Um, so if it, this, you know what this reminds me of, uh, I used to, my grandmother used to buy me these uh, puzzle books when I was little, and they had these kind of games where you had a chart and it was like, Susie won the race. Uh, Jack didn't win, but he did not lose. Uh, Ronald came in between Susie and Jack, and uh, Jim did not finish last. And you have to, from that information, fill out the chart and just kind of use logic to figure out uh, who's on what side. And we're doing the same type of logic game here when we're visual phasing. Uh, 
we're just using whatever information we can to distinguish between my mom's mom's side and my mom's dad's side. Uh, and then we're looking for every possible, uh, uh, anything you could possibly glean from that information based on, you know, overlapping segments, based on twin versus, I mean, based on the good side versus the evil side being opposites, uh, based on overlap with siblings, if you have siblings, uh, based on known relatives, you're just going to use all the information you can. Uh, and w exactly what information you have is sometimes it's going to be specific to your family and uh, just uh, feel free to ask members in our in our Borland Genetics group and we'll help you with this process. Uh, a bunch of us have done this already and know how to do it and it will just be a matter of applying it to your family, although we might need some of your help for identifying who uh, the people are or what it is that we can use to dis distinguish uh, the sides of the family. Um, whether it be that one side's from Baltimore and the other side's from New York, you know, that, that, that may be enough. Uh, sometimes it doesn't take a lot because you really only have to know a couple dozens on each chromosome. And if you've got hundreds on each chromosome, for example, say, if you're dealing with colonial America uh, ancestors, then this, this really should be a breeze for most people, as long as you could somehow distinguish between the, you know, the parents' parents in some way or another. So what do we do next, uh, process-wise? Uh, we are going to put all of this data into a program called DNA Painter, and that's another website. And we'll go online to DNA Painter, and I'll show you what I did. So we're in my DNA Painter account, and that's just dnapainter.com if you're not familiar with it. And uh, this is um, uh, software. It's in beta stage. Uh, it's relatively new uh, by a guy, Johnny Pearl, in England. And uh, I highly recommend that you subscribe to this if you're going to be using Borland Genetics um, to reconstruct your family. And that is because it allows you to do things like have multiple profiles like I do here, and also because it, uh, it really uh, allows easier import and export of data. So, okay, I did, you know, I'm working on Jeff and Susan. We talked about them before, but here we go. Kathy phased Kevin. So here's how I did it. And this is important because the formatting has to be exact uh, for Borland Genetics reverse phasing tool. And I'll read this out loud here. The first paternal chromosome represents Kathy and Kevin. That By first, I don't mean chromosome one. I mean the top. If you're familiar with DNA Painter, the top is usually used for paternal, but here we're using it for something for, we're, we're, we're misusing his product, but uh, it's really a versatile product and I enjoy using it here. It makes data entry pretty simple for what we're doing. Uh, so let's take an example. Let's go down to, oh, and the uh, before we do, the second maternal chromosome, and I have it in quotes because that's the intended use of DNA Painter, but we're using it instead to mean Kathy X Kevin. And that's, uh, I, I always keep track of whether I use build 36 or 37 coordinates. J right ordinary jet match is 36 coordinates. And that's just the output I mean, I'm talking about from the matching segment tool. So if you're using regular jet match, it's 36. If you're using jet match genesis, uh, you can pick and, and you can do 36 or 37 with my program. Uh, okay, and I also write where I got the data from because jet match matching segment tool isn't the only segment export tool in the business. Some sites like, uh, I believe, Family Tree DNA also are, allow uh, export, uh, positional data export. Okay, so for 11, you can see I painted my top chromosome red and my bottom one green. And that's as simple as that. However, say on chromosome 10, which might have been a more fun example, uh, you know, you see I had a, when my mom, uh, there we go, at around 17. Right? That, that 1.0 centimeter is just filler data. I did that in export. I just put an entire column of ones. Um, but anyway, because I didn't do this manually, but I could have. So the recombination point is about 17.1 there. Uh, and some chromosomes, like the big chromosomes, are going to have, you know, maybe two. Here, this one had one, two, three, four uh, recombination points on chromosome two. And, you know, the, the it goes by how many centimorgans, because the definition of a centimorgan is uh, the probability in one generation of a certain span of DNA having a recombination event. 
So a long segment with many centimorgans, of, you know, maybe 250 plus, like so, so like the first chromosome, it's going to have two or three. Whereas a short chromosome, like 22, you know, I don't have one, but, you know, they don't always. Sometimes, uh, like chromosome 21, you get the whole thing, or like even sometimes 14 or 11. These smaller chromosomes may never recombine, uh, whereas the larger ones may have many recombinations. So we can go back to, and we'll take a look. Files. I also did this for Kathy Stephen. And, you know, if you look at his number 11, I'm sorry, yes, chromosome 11. Uh, it looks just like we had it in the Excel, right? I used the same colors even. So red, green, red, and green, red, green for his anti-self. Um, so now once we've done this, uh, we I gotta got to export this so Borland Genetics can read it. I'm going to go back to my example here. Kathy Faye's Kevin. That's real simple. Uh, you just go to Settings. And all segment data. And you don't want to use a data backup file. You want to use the CSV file. So you basically just click on it. And like anything else in this program, uh, let's show it in the folder. Let's take a look at the folder. There it is. A bunch of other junk in that folder. But what we're going to do is we're going to just going to open up the data library, drag it in because you got to have everything in the same folder. And is, there's already one in there. Of course there is because I did this uh, some time ago, this exercise. So I, mean, I don't really need to replace it, whatever. It's the same data. Okay. So now let's go back to Borland Genetics and We've got our resource list still populated there. Go back to the main menu, and we're going to do finally use the reverse phase tool. Select, and please select the parent. I mean, it has no way of knowing whether I am the parent or my mom is. So Kathleen is the parent. Select. Please select a child from the list below. And that, of course, is Kevin. Select. Now, select the build of build of coordinates used to perform visual phasing. So that's the, uh, here we're talking about what coordinates were used in the matching segment tool. And that's build 36 because that's what GEDmatch is. And I put that in parentheses here, not because these are the only sources of data for build 36 or build 37, but just as a reminder in case you forget. Um, okay, so continue. And now you gotta pick the DNA painter export. And that was called Kathy Phase Kevin. So it's going to take a look at the contents of that file. Shouldn't take too long. Okay, and it, what it basically does is if we went back to the internet here, close this, it finds the names on the legend. And I'll close this so you can see what I'm talking about. Notice that there's two, and if you look through the instruction manual, it'll explain a little more clearly on why and how, uh, but basically, it would be degenerate if you didn't, because you have to. It has to have the same name for purposes of the Borland Genetics tool, because it. Asks, I'm sorry, because it asks you which is the grandfather, for example, right? So if you got two different names for, like, let's say you had Joseph Kevin contribution for the top one, and you had Joseph Evil Kevin contribution, you know, you need both. It's uh, it's going to essentially my program will realign these. It's going to switch all of the, you know, red to the top, say, and all the green to the bottom on every chromosome. It's going to realign them and uh, result in a paternal set and a maternal set or a kit. I'm sorry. Uh, so you got to have the same name, but you got to make one paternal and one maternal when you're setting it up. And the same thing for Margaret, uh, which is my mother's mother. All right. So here we go. Which is the grandfather? Joseph, of course. Which is the grandmother? Margaret, of course. Select, and now we just watch my progress bars. I'm gonna make these progress bars a little nicer in future versions of the tool, but for now,
they give us some idea of what's going on most of the time. But there are some gaps. Uh, I will implement an overall progress bar as opposed to just progress of certain aspects of the tool. And there we go. Now it's performing merge calculations. It wasn't because of anything I moved a mouse. It just took its time there. Um, some of these processes are very memory intensive, uh, especially if you're using large files like combined template files or things like that. But it will work with them as so long as your computer has the memory resources to do that. So it's got a lot of calculations to do. It takes a few minutes. And like I said, I will make a nicer progress bar feature for future versions of this program. But for now, it just lets you know that it basically hasn't crashed and that it's actually doing something, which is good. Oh, uh, I almost thought it was done. But, you know, back in the day when I was doing this in Excel before I wrote this uh, program, this part, the, the calculations and what it's doing now, probably would have taken me a week. And instead, now it takes like five, five minutes or so. So it's quite an improvement on the old process of doing that by hand in Excel, uh, manipulating the uh, raw data files. Getting there. I want to say it flashes once for each segment. So for each, you know, red or green segment on the uh, DNA painter chart. Maybe a hundred times or so before it's done with all of its calculations. And the fact that I'm recording a video on the background of my computer while this is running is probably not making this run any faster. It's going faster now for some reason. Maybe the shorter segments on some of the smaller chromosomes as we get towards the bottom, presumably. And just so uh, you know, that when you have those matching segment spreadsheets, it's okay if they overlap a little, you know, where you decide the end of one segment is and the beginning of the other. I tend to err on the side of not making gaps unless, you know, there's a big gap where you'd have to guess, you know, like between 30 and 60 or something like that. But if it's, if it like looks like one match goes to 51 and another match starts at 50, but it's not really a significant overlap and you know there's a recombination point in there somehow, um, then I, I just use the actual data and the program is a little smart in that it will try to figure out where the real recombination point is. And it does a pretty good job of that. It's got some, uh, some intelligence in it uh, designed for that purpose. Okay. Now it must be preparing the files. Again, future versions will communicate a little better as far as what's going on. Still going. Yeah. 
And if there was an issue, it would tell you. Uh, most common issue with this tool is the the formatting doesn't comply with the uh, with the tool. Um, and again, you can reference the instruction manual as far as how to format the file so that it's compatible. I'm sorry, format the DNA painter profile so that it's compatible. And again, make sure you export the CSV, not the backup file, because that will create an error as well. But so far, no errors. It's just taking its time and uh, going really slow because I'm recording a video while I'm doing this. And both of those processes are very memory, memory intensive. And this is a little bit of an older computer. But I don't want to fast forward through it because I don't want to exaggerate the amount of time it takes. It does take a little time. When it paused, I think that was when it finished the uh, perhaps Kevin versus anti Kevin. I had just assumed it was almost done, but I think it was just almost done with one of my cells. And now it's doing the other half. Are we there yet? Almost. Oh. Saving Joseph, 50%. Success. Saving Margaret, 50%. Now, it should pop us back up with the menu. Success. Reverse phase con reconstruction complete. Reconstructed grandparent resources successfully added to the active resource list. I return to the main menu. Take a look at our DNA resources. And lo and behold, there's Joseph, mono, 50%. Margaret, mono, 50%. And these I have uploaded to GEDmatch, and they work very well. Um, well, they work exactly as I told them to, whichever matches, you know, I selected in the matching segment tool that were on the Joseph side. It will show as uh, kits that match Joseph. And, the you know, these are fully compatible with full processing on GEDmatch. So it'll show all of the, uh, it'll show a full cousin list of Joseph and a full cousin list of Margaret. Um, and now, you know, since I had uh, my mother's full sister test, uh, I could, you know, there, come up with another Joseph and a Margaret uh, based on her data, uh, which I have done. And uh, we'll get into combining kits and things like that in uh, future demonstrations. But uh, let's call it a day. We've reversed phased.